This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 18 of the Homestead Journey Podcast, or as we like to say around here, step number 18 on our journey towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on the Homestead Journey. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us on the Homestead Journey. This week was really the best week so far for this podcast from the standpoint of the number of downloads. Uh, so thank you very much for that. Um, you know, I, I I guess that we have people that are sharing the podcast with friends and, and family and neighbors and maybe some even some enemies. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, thank you, folks, for joining us on the Homestead Journey. I really appreciate it. And uh, this week was a really, really good week for this podcast. And maybe it was just having a great guest on here last week. Um, if you haven't listened to episode number 16, go back. I'm sorry, episode number 17. Go back and check it out. I was joined by my son, Brian Wells Jr., and it was a lot of fun as we talked about chickens. Anyhow, let's jump into this week's episode, starting with this week's Homestead Happenings. So this week on the homestead, it was a rather weird week for my wife and I, simply because our son was in Costa Rica and Panama for the majority of the week. And so on one hand, it um, well, we had to do his chores. <laughs> and sometimes I think I, I take for granted what he does until I have to do it. Um, so it meant a little extra carrying of water and a little extra carrying feed and, and those kinds of things and having to remember to check on the animals at, at certain times of the day that I, I normally am not checking on animals. But along with that, it really provided me with an opportunity to spend time um, with my wife. And I'm very, very blessed, folks. Um, I have a wife that at least, well, if... If she doesn't like spending time with me, she at least fakes it really, really well. <laughs> no, well, we really get along well together. We're we're friends. It's not just husband and wife, but we're friends. And I don't take that for granted. I mean, sometimes I do. Honestly, you know, sometimes you can. Um, but I, I really do realize how blessed I am to have a relationship like that with her. Because I know some people who are married that can't stand each other, don't like to be around each other. Um, they're, you know, whenever they have a free moment, they're off with their friends, not with their, you know, not with their spouses. And, uh, I just really appreciated spending time, um, with my wife this week. Oh, <laughs> there were times it's, it's kind of funny. Like, what are you going to do? I don't know. Let's go to bed early. It's like eight 30, man. We were in bed, gone, sleeping. I don't know. Getting old, um, <laughs> old age is creeping up on me as is proof. Uh, proven by the gray in the beard and the gray in the hair above my temples. Anyhow, enough of that. Um, this week, the seed order uh, started, uh, continued to arrive, and I've uh, been posting pictures to Instagram and Facebook of that. So if you haven't already, jump on to Facebook. If you are on Facebook, uh, give us a like, um, or on Instagram, give us a follow, and uh, you can keep up to date with some of the things that we have going on here on the homestead. This week, we also were battling the elements. Um, kind of a cold front came through, and we had some cold nights, some cold days. You know, some of those days where I, I kind of jokingly say that you can tell how cold it is by how the snow crunches under your feet and how quickly the nose hairs freeze to the inside of your nose. And we certainly had some of those days this week on the homestead. This week I also um, had the opportunity, because it was, it was holiday break, I didn't have Boy Scouts, we didn't have choir, so we had some, some free days uh, to spend some time doing some of that cleanup and organization that doesn't happen during the busier times of the year. Um, now I'll be the first one to admit I have a, a bit of pack raditis combined with a tendency to kind of drop a tool where I was using it. 
uh, not put things back where I should. Um, and so uh, this week I had some, uh, you know, the opportunity to kind of spend some time undoing some of that stuff, sorting some things out, getting rid of some things, cleaning some things up. Um, and it really feels good to, to do that. We still have more to do, but uh, it, it did feel good to accomplish some of that. I also spent uh, some time this week um, doing some homestead reading. And I've uh, been really enjoying some of the books that uh, I've been reading. Again, if you follow us on Facebook or Instagram, you saw this week that I finished up the book Up Tunket Road. Now, I had promised that I was going to do uh, a book review and I recorded that for this week's podcast. But when I put it all together, what I found is that this podcast would be almost an hour long. I also put a poll up on our Facebook uh, page asking whether or not people would prefer to see the book reviews as a, as a segment within our normal podcast episodes or whether or not they would like to see them as a standalone episode. And really, the feedback was split almost 50-50. So after seeing how long this episode was going to be, including the book review, and kind of the fact that there really wasn't much of a strong opinion one way or the other as far as how people wanted to see that delivered, what I decided to do was to pull it out of this week's episode, and then in a future episode, it will become um, a part of a Charting the Course segment. Now, if you feel very strongly that you would love to hear these as um, a standalone episode, or you wouldn't mind an episode that's an hour long because of a book review, uh, let me know that. I would love to hear your feedback. But I just felt like it didn't make a whole lot of sense to have an hour-long episode, and it didn't feel like there was really a strong uh, desire to see them as standalone episodes. So I'm just going to hold that book review. I've got it recorded and ready to go, and so you will be hearing it in a future episode. Anyhow, when I was done reading Up Tunket Road, I jumped on over to the book written by Harold Thornborough, and uh, so I am reading that and really, really enjoying that book, and uh, eventually I will also be doing a review of that. So, got some homestead reading in this week, uh, and finally I wanted to share with you a little bit about our journey uh, with regards to our, I don't want to call it diet, but um, our attempt to eat a little better, a little healthier, a little bit more natural. And really, folks, we've been doing a really, really good job of that. Or I shouldn't say we. Uh, my wife has been doing, because she does a lot of the cooking here. Um, but we have really, uh, now have we, you know, banned all processed foods from our home? No. But we have really minimized the amount of, processed foods, the amount of sugars that we're eating, and uh, it has been very much a, a more natural, a more um, cooking from scratch kind of uh, approach to, uh, to eating, and um, I've really, really been enjoying it. And this week, we had two meals in particular that jump out at me. First of all, she made a recipe from Jill Wingert's cookbook, called, I think, Rustic Potato Sausage and Kale Soup or something along those lines that perhaps is the best soup that I have ever, ever had uh, in my life. And uh, I don't say that lightly. It was excellent soup. Um, it had bacon and sausage from our American guinea hogs in it, and it had kale that we had preserved uh, in it as well. Um, the potatoes that were in it and some of the spices and whatnot we didn't grow here on the homestead but a good portion of that soup was uh contained things that we had raised and grown here on our homestead so obviously there's a sense of satisfaction that comes along with that but boy folks that just was an excellent 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 soup i really really enjoyed it and then last night uh, my wife works on Fridays, and so I was home early or before her uh, last night, so I cooked supper. And uh, she had some hamburger that she had uh, thought out and said, could you make something with it? Sure. 
And uh, so I have a tendency to be a little bit more creative, I think, when it comes to uh, cooking, kind of just throwing stuff together and making it up as I go along. And so I went ahead and fried up that hamburger in a cast iron skillet. And then I put it into a pan and I uh, opened up a, it was a quart of our turkey bone broth and a quart of our stewed tomatoes. And I put those in there with some spices. I think I put in some Italian seasoning and some salt and pepper. And I don't remember what all I put in there. And got that uh, cooking down and brought it to a boil. And then I think we had some rigatoni left over. Rigatoni noodles. And dumped that in there. And in the meantime, we had some center cut squash that we grew last year. Uh, it From seeds that we got from Row 7 Seed Company. And I thinly sliced that up and threw that into the broiler. And uh, then I opened up a can of the applesauce that we processed last uh, fall. And folks, let me tell you something. It was delicious. Whew. And I'm not bragging on myself. So if this comes across as braggadocious, I apologize. But that was some of the best applesauce I've ever eaten. Oh my goodness, it was so good. And then the uh, and the soup, oh my, it was it came out really, really, really well. Um, and so again, there's that sense of satisfaction that comes from, I think, cooking with ingredients, good ingredients. But when you've when you've grown or raised the food that you're you're cooking and then you're eating, there's that sense of satisfaction that comes from that that I think is just absolutely awesome. And so it really made me happy to be a homesteader this week simply because of the food that I was eating. Anyhow, that's what's been happening here on 3B Farm and Homestead. I hope things are going well where you are at and uh, that you had a good week as well. Let's jump on over to this episode's Charting the Course. This is our third episode in a multi-part series with regards to raising chickens. The first two episodes, we really focused more on raising chickens or the types of chickens, the breeds of chickens that we would raise to lay eggs. On this episode, I want to spend some time talking about raising chickens for meat. There's some similarities and there are some differences with regards to how you approach raising chickens for meat versus how you would raise chickens for eggs. And it's important to know those differences, those nuances, in order to have the most success in doing this. When raising chickens for meat, the first thing you're going to need to do is to decide what type of chicken you're going to raise. You really have two major choices and as with anything in life, they both have their pluses and their minuses. You can either raise a broiler breed or you can raise a standard heavy bodied or dual purpose breed. The first option you have are broiler birds. Now these are breeds that have been developed specifically for meat production. These are going to grow more quickly than the standard breed chickens, which means generally speaking, less time needed to produce the same amount of meat. And they're going to have a, a lower feed conversion ratio, which is really just a fancy way of saying they're going to take less feed than a standard breed to generate the same amount of meat. The downsides to these birds is that depending on the breed you get, they can have higher mortality rates. Um, they're growing so fast that their bodies, their hearts, their legs sometimes can give out. Um, they're also a hybrid bird. And that means that their origins are a closely guarded secret. So that means that you can't breed them and hatch eggs for a continuous supply of chicken. You will need to rely on hatcheries uh, to supply you with the chicks to raise. Now with broiler breeds, you have three main options or three main choices. You have the Cornish Cross, the Cornish Roaster, and the Ranger style broilers, which can vary from hatchery to hatchery, but have names like Red Ranger, Freedom Ranger, Red Ranger, or at Moyer Hatchery, they refer to them as Royal Broilers. The Cornish Cross is the breed that most people are used to seeing at the grocery store. They have the big breast with the meaty legs and the meaty thighs. 
they have the lowest average feed conversion ratio, which again is the amount of feed that they need to reach butchering weight. They're the quickest growing breed. They reach butchering weight in as little as six weeks, although most people will raise them out to about eight weeks and some let them go a little bit longer to get a bigger bird. At six weeks, they might average to be around three and a half to four pounds. At eight weeks, at around five pounds, and at 10 weeks, around seven or eight pounds. They're a white bird with minimal feathers, so they're easy to pluck and to process. Now, less feed inputs and less labor inputs means that the Cornish cross is generally the most economical option for raising meat chickens, which is why that's the breed that you see in the grocery store. However, they do have downsides. Um, first, these have perhaps the highest mortality rate because they grow so big so quickly, their hearts and their legs sometimes just can't keep up. Secondly, they're not great foragers. By and large, they're going to be content to sit by the feeders and eat and poop and eat and poop and eat and poop. And speaking of their poop, it smells horrible. Not that any poop smells good, <laughs> but this just takes it to a whole nother level. It is just absolutely the most noxious stuff you will ever, ever smell. Um, this breed also really lacks personality. If you're used to raising standard breed chickens and you enjoy the nuances between how the different breeds um, act, you're going to be vastly disappointed with a Cornish cross. They're an ungainly bird. They're, I hate to say it, but they're fairly stupid birds. I mean, not that any chicken is all that intelligent, but they are really, really, really dumb chickens. And because of their ungainly size, they're also very easy pickings for predators. Now, the Cornish roaster it's a variation of the Cornish cross that attempts to deal with some of its deficiencies. It still has the broad breast, the meaty thighs, the meaty legs. Um, it just doesn't grow as quickly as the Cornish cross. So it doesn't have the same issues with hearts and legs giving out. But that means longer time to reach butchering weight, on average about two weeks longer, and they take more feed to reach butchering weight. The ranger style of broiler is the third option you have. These are going to reach butchering weight at about 12 weeks, which is much quicker than the 16 to 24 weeks it could take to raise a standard breed chicken. The ranger variety is generally a more active alternative to the Cornish cross, which means that they can forage better. But And, and this um, activity means a bit of a darker meat that some people say has more of a chickeny I don't know if that's a word. Is chickeny a word? But it has a more chickeny flavor. But even with them foraging for some of their own food, they do have a higher feed conversion ratio than the Cornish cross. They're going to require more feed. They have feathers more in line with a standard breed chicken, which means they're also going to be harder to pluck clean. And their body shape is more comparable to a standard breed chicken than it is to the Cornish cross. That means that the breast is more pointed in shape than rounded, and it's nowhere near as large as the breast on a Cornish cross. Um, they also don't have quite as meaty legs and thighs. And their added activity could also lead to a texture of the meat that's a little bit tougher, a little bit chewier than what people are used to. So marketing them, if you're going to try to sell these birds, might take a little bit more effort because they don't look like what people are used to seeing. They don't necessarily taste like what people are used to experiencing in chicken. Now, raising standard breed chickens, for me, is the last option we'll talk about. As Brian J. Uh, mentioned last week on last week's episode, there are some breeds that are considered dual purpose breeds. And by dual purpose, that means that they're a heavier bodied bird, so they're going to be just as good for meat as they are for egg laying. 
And these would be breeds like your Buff Orpingtons, Rhode Island Reds, Bard Rocks, Jersey Giants, Delawares, and kind of the list goes on and on. As we mentioned before, perhaps the biggest reason to go this route is that you no longer have to rely on a hatchery to supply you with chicks. As long as you have a rooster and some hens, you can have a sustainable system whereby you are continually producing a supply of chicks to raise for meat. However, even without the cost of purchasing chicks, this can be the least economical approach to raising chickens. Standard breeds will take you longer, much, much longer to raise to butchering weight. Some people suggest that you can butcher them in as little as 16 weeks. However, my experience has been that it takes 20 to 24 weeks um, to reach the weight that you're going to be looking for. Not only does this take more labor, this approach also has the highest feed conversion ratio. And because they're so active, if you're keeping them in a chicken tractor, you will find that you need to move them more frequently than you would a broiler breed, in particular the Cornish Cross, and you'll need more ground to move them over. Otherwise, you are going to end up with a moonscape. Processing standard breed chickens also requires the most amount of labor. Um, they're going to have more feathers, and depending on the breed, they can have dark pin feathers, which makes it difficult to pluck clean. Because they are more active, they can be harder to catch in order to be able to process. And so all of that adds to your overall labor time um, when processing the chickens. While the taste of the standard breeds is a bit more chickeny to some people, the meat they produce will generally be darker in color and tougher to chew. They've been using their muscles more for a longer period of time, and so those fibers, well, they're going to be a little bit more fibrous than in the Cornish Cross or even the, the Ranger breeds of broiler chickens. The breast will be smaller and more pointy in shape, and the legs and thighs um, are not going to be as meaty as your broiler breeds. If you're growing these to sell, you may need to work harder at marketing them because they don't look like what people are used to seeing in the grocery store. They're not going to taste or have the texture of what people are used to having in chicken. Now, raising standard breeds for meat is the most sustainable option, but Due to the labor and the higher feed conversion ratios, it is not the most economically sound way to raise meat chickens. Now, if you decide to raise standard breed chickens, your feeding and care for them will be the same as with your egg layers. If you have a lot of males, you may want to separate them from your females because the males can be pushy for food. And as they begin to mature, they may start tearing up the females um, trying to breed them. But generally speaking, their housing and their feed requirements are the same as for your layers. Broiler chickens have different needs. So because of this, you shouldn't brood them with standard breed chickens. The broilers are going to grow quicker and they will quickly outcompete the standard breeds for feed and water. And at the early stages, they could actually injure and even kill the smaller standard breed chicks. After two weeks, you may want to consider restricting feed from them, giving them access to feed for 12 hours during the day, and then removing it from their brooders and pen at night. They should always have access to water. After four weeks, you will want to switch them from a starter grower feed to a broiler feed that is formulated to help promote growth, again, keeping with the 12 hours on, 12 hours off access to feed schedule. Because it grows so quickly, the Cornish cross cannot roost, and so it will spend its life on the ground. So you need to keep that in mind as you're designing the housing that you're going to keep your broilers in. That means that your chicken houses shouldn't have a ramp for them to go up, and their chicken tractors will not need roosting bars. They're not going to be able to fly up to roost at night. You're going to then need to ensure that they have proper predator protection because they're going to be vulnerable since they are on the ground all of the time. As I said before, these broiler chicks, especially the Cornish Cross, 
are little poop factories. And so you will find that you need to refresh the bedding in their brooder more often than the standard breed chicks. And you're going to need to make sure that you move their chicken tractors frequently to avoid manure buildup. So having talked about the different types of chickens you can raise for meat and the similarities and the differences between raising broilers and standard breeds for chickens, what do we do here on 3B Farm and Homestead? Well, let me kind of tell you a little bit about our journey in raising meat chickens before I share with you exactly what we're doing now. When we first took over the chicken operation from my grandfather, we continued doing what he had always done. My grandfather would in the spring, order the special assorted bargain or hatchery surplus or whatever they were calling it at the time. These are basically the extra chicks that they have left over from hatching. Generally speaking, they sell these as straight run for a cheaper price than you were would pay if you were to order a specific breed. So you never knew what kind of breed you were going to get, how many males or how many females you might get. It was kind of a mystery bag. My grandfather would generally order twice as many chicks as he wanted layers. So if he wanted 25 layers, he'd order 50 chicks. If he wanted 50 layers, he'd order 100 chicks. And then in the fall, when the pullets would start laying, he would then dress off the cockerels and the previous year's hens. Because pullets will usually lay right through their first winter, this meant that he would always continually have access to eggs, and meat, and he was never feeding hens that weren't laying. It was also a great way to experiment and to experience a variety of different breeds. Because again, you never knew what kind of chickens you were getting. Depending on the hatchery, you, they might even include light breeds, they might include specialty breeds, they might include rare breeds. You just never knew. Now, the downside to this is that Sometimes you could get more cockerels than you got pullets. So maybe you ordered 50, hoping for 25 pullets, and maybe you, out of all of those 50, you only got 10 pullets. Or you might get a lot of light-bodied birds. Um, so you never knew uh, what you would get. And for some people, this really isn't a good option anyhow, because maybe where they're at, they can't have cockerels. Uh, maybe they can't have roosters. And so maybe due to regulations or their desire to be good neighbors. Um, but this is what my grandfather did for years and years and years, and it worked for him. One year then we decided that we were going to, instead of ordering chicks, we were going to allow some broody hens to set and hatch out their own chicks. This was a lot of fun for us to watch. It, it, it was nice not having to buy chicks, but it certainly wasn't as reliable as ordering from the hatchery. We had no idea how many, if any, of the eggs were going to hatch. We didn't know how many cockerels we'd be getting versus pullets. There was just a lot of unknowns in that approach. I then saw in a catalog that they sold male chicks for a really, really cheap price. I'm wanting to say it was like less than 50 cents a chick. And so one year, I ordered 50 cockerels and raised them in chicken tractors. This was actually the first year I ever kept track of the amount of money I was spending on chickens. I had always just kind of gone to the feed store and bought feed when I needed it. I went and bought chicks when I needed them. I never really kept track of how much it cost me. But what happened is some friends of mine asked me to raise them a batch of 25. And so I told them that I would do it at cost. I quickly found that the money I had saved in buying those chicks was spent in buying feed for them because they have a much higher feed conversion ratio. The other thing that I found is that our yard is not big enough to raise that many standard breed birds at a time. They're simply far too active. Uh, I would have to move them at least twice a day to keep them from tearing the yard into scorched earth, <laughs> and because they took so long to grow out, I had to pass over the same area multiple times, and quite frankly, I don't think my yard has ever fully recovered. However, the biggest reason I quit raising standard breed birds for meat is because my wife and son didn't care for them. 
They both prefer breast meat, and there's not as much breast meat on a standard breed chicken as there is on a broiler breed. But simply put, they didn't care for the texture. And so while I was putting all of these chickens in the freezer every year, my wife wasn't cooking them up that much, and it really was simply a waste. Now, about four years ago, just about when they would start laying, my pullets got hit by predators. And so I opted to winter over the previous year's hens that year, something I had never done before. And so the following year, I knew I couldn't take those chickens and put them in the freezer to cook as roasters. So that year I opted to pressure can them. And we found out that we love the meat like that. I canned up the broth and we found that we loved that. And so the following spring, I decided to try a batch of Cornish crosses and we found out that we really, really liked them. That year we did a batch in the spring and one in the fall. And last year we just did a batch in the spring. And for the time being, that's going to be our approach. Our schedules in the fall are just too crazy. The weather is too unreliable to deal with butchering chickens. In the fall, we're busy canning. Um, and, and again, we just never know when it's going to get cold and make that processing very, very miserable. So right now, we're kind of taking a bit of a hybrid approach. We are still buying chickens in the spring or chicks in the spring and then raising them out. And then when they start laying in the fall, we are dressing those hens off for meat. But what we're doing with those chickens is canning that meat up to use in things like casseroles and soups and stews and things like that. And then in the spring, we're doing our single batch of Cornish crosses that we are then putting in the freezer to use for roast chicken and baked chicken and stewed chicken and things like that. So that brings us to the end of this episode and our discussion on the topic of raising chickens for meat. If you have any questions about any of the topics that we've covered or there's questions that you have that I didn't answer, feel free to reach out to me the Homestead Journey Podcast at gmail.com, or you can reach us on Instagram, on our Facebook page, or on YouTube, uh, on our YouTube channel. If you are enjoying what you're hearing here on the Homestead Journey Podcast, please jump on over to your favorite podcast platform and give us a thumbs up, or leave us a review, or the a five-star rating, whatever it is that your favorite podcast platform allows. Uh, if you're on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, a subscription. Um, I really, really appreciate it. And then share it with other people that you think might enjoy what we're doing here on the Homestead Journey. As always, folks, the music on this episode is provided by Audionautics.com. So a big shout out to them and a big thank you to them. And until next time, everybody. Keep up the good work.